right, so here's the fourth video that we're going to look at. This one looks at five topics. These are topics that you see typically in trig or more challenging trig or challenging questions. One of the biggest tips I can give you for challenge questions is think. That is the number one thing that, you have, that you're going to have to do on the ACT, and that is one of the big things that the ACT is testing. So let's get started with some more complex trig. Some of the ACT goes beyond just right triangles. So here's a question. It says that the sine theta is negative 3 fifths and pi uh, is less than theta, which is less than 3 pi over 2, then tan theta equals 1. So if you're looking at this one, you've never seen a question like this before. It can be kind of daunting, but there's a couple key things in this problem. This is a challenge question. The first thing is where is this angle? Angle is between pi and 3 pi over 2. So this is where i got to know a little bit about the unit circle to know this is 0, this is pi over 2, okay, or 90. This is pi, and then this is 3 pi over 2. So what this is telling me is that this angle is here. And when I draw my triangle, it's important to remember that theta has to go always between the x-axis and the terminal side of my angle. So that's key, is that, that where theta is going to go there. So now there's my angle, okay? So now it says the sine of theta equals negative 3 fifths. So here's where i got to remember my Sokotoa. So I'm looking at the sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And it's not just 3 fifths, it's negative 3 fifths. And it's important to know that the hypotenuse won't be negative, it'll be the opposite in this case. So now it says, what's the tan of theta? Well, here's where you got to say, okay, if I want to do tan of theta, I would need the opposite and the adjacent. But I don't have the adjacent, so here's where you have to do Pythagorean theorem. And you have to understand also, the adjacent is going to be negative as well, because it's to the left of the y-axis, it's going, it's going left, so it's a, it's a horizontal value going to the left. So therefore, if I call this x, and here's another point where your, your Pythagorean triples are going to help you. You might know already that's going to be 4. Okay, if you want to work it all out, you would get 4. And the trick to, is to know, like, once I've found that that's 4, you know that that's not just 4, that's negative 4. That's key, because it is to the left. It's negative. So now, if the sine was negative 3 fifths, what's the tan of theta? So now I'm going to come over here. The tan of theta was opposite over adjacent, so negative 3 over negative 4, or 3 over 4. So here's just a question that might pop up. A little more complex than just a straight right triangle problem because it's in the, in the third quadrant. The values are negative. Common error is to just make that 4 positive. You might know all, everything what to do except for that negative 4. The next one I want to look at looks complicated, but really is, is, is kind of like a question that tells you what to do. And we said look out for questions that tell you what to do. And here's one of those. So this one, it says, what is sine pi over 12 given that pi over 12 is pi over 3 minus pi over 4? And that sine of alpha minus beta equals the sine of alpha cos beta minus the cos of alpha sine beta. Okay, so you may use the following table. It tells you everything you need to know. It gives you the table. It gives you everything. It looks like this complicated trig problem, but actually it tells you basically all, everything that you need. Sine of theta or sine of alpha minus beta. I want to take sine of pi over 12. Well, the sine of pi over 12, it tells us, is the same as taking the sine of pi over 3 minus pi over 4. The next thing says, well, the sine of something minus something is the sine of alpha, which is in this case pi over 3, times the cos beta minus the cos alpha, which is pi over 3, times the sine beta. And if you're like, what did you just do? I just kind of followed this thing right here. And I just put in pi over 3 and pi over 4. I called pi over 3, essentially I called that alpha. And I called pi over 4, I called that beta. And then I went from there. Okay, if, you, if you're like alpha, beta, what are you talking about? It's just A, B. We could, we could say that. But now at this point, you just use the table. So now what's sine of pi over 3? So I go sine pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. Cos of pi over 4. Cos pi over 4, root 2 over 2. Okay, so now just multiplying these together. Cos of pi over 3. Cos pi over 3 is a half. And then sine of pi over 4. Sine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So it's just following the table, looking at those values. I don't use any of the pi's over 6's because that's not something that's in there, but there you go. So now you multiply this out. Root 3 and root 2 is root 6. 2 times 2, straight across is 4. Top, 1 times root 2 is, is root 2. It's a minus over 4. So the answer to this, if you had to pick between these, these five choices... It's 6 minus root 2 over 4. This is a question where if you take your time, you should be able to nail it, okay? It looks complicated. It looks like a lot. It's got a big table. It's got a lot of alpha, beta. It's, very, it's a very scary-looking problem, but if you just take your time with it, it's actually not that bad. 
right, the next thing we're going to talk about that pops up a lot on the ACT are equations of circles and graphs of circles. And with these questions, I really stress that you, you kind of visualize what you're looking at. So or what, the question, what, the, what the circle would look like. So you see that x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. hk is the center, r is the radius, so that's going to be key. So it says in this first problem, the standard xy coordinate plane, the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals 81. So there's nothing in either of these. So therefore, the center is 0, 0. So there was no h, there was no k, so it's 0, 0. So the radius is square, is radius squared is 81, which means that the radius is 9. If you're like, how'd you get that? I just square rooted both sides. So therefore, the radius is 9, the center is 0, 0. And now the next question is, what points does the circle intersect the y-axis? So here's where a, a good visual representation will help you. So the center at 0, 0, and then the radius is 9, right? So I'm going over 9, so this would be at 9, 0, to the, over 9 to the right and left, and then up 9 or down 9. So up 9 is 0, 9, down 9 is 0, negative 9. So there's my circle. Where does it cross the y-axis? Well, it crosses the y-axis here at 0, 9, and here at 0, negative 9. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to visualize. All of these choices um, are actually points on the y-axis. If you just recognize that the radius equals 9, then you're pretty much on for part, for question, for part B there. You know that B is the answer. Okay? So, but a good visual representation doesn't hurt. Example 2, it says a circle in the standard x-y coordinate plane is tangent to the x-axis at 5 and tangent to the y-axis at 5, which is the following is the equation. So now I really need that visual representation. So I'm like, okay. You're tangent to the x-axis at 5, tangent to the y-axis at 5. So you're like, the center's somewhere here. So this circle looks kind of like this, okay? So you got this thing. So the radius to this thing would be 5. And the center point right here is over 5, up 5. So therefore, what you, now, you, now you know the center and radius. And you're like, well, how did you find the center radius? I kind of just thought about it. I looked at the, I looked at the graph. The fact that it was tangent means that it grazes the sides. There's a word that you know means intersects the side at one point, the side of the, the, the circle intersects the circle at one point. So if the axes are tangent, that's what it looks like. So then the radius is 5, the, the center is 5, 5. So then I go ahead and I just find the equation that matches that. So it's going to be opposite, and that's the trick here. A lot of students will probably pick E. It's always x minus 5, y minus 5. And it's not 5, just 5, it's 5 squared. So the correct answer here is x minus 5 squared plus y minus 5 squared equals 25. So there, a couple of uh, quick re recap of equations of circles. I know you see that in, in geometry. I know you see that in algebra too, but it's still good to look at again. And the kind of questions that they can ask can be kind of tricky. So again, just think. Try to think about it visually and take your time. The next thing we're going to talk about is more of a strategy. And sometimes with challenge questions, the only thing that you can do is to work backwards, okay? It's a good strategy also when you get stuck. And then number two, sometimes it's the only way to determine the answer. So look for which of the following, uh, and then you know that you're looking at the answer. So here's a question on the, on the ACT, ACT practice test. This is if x and y are positive integers such, as the such that the greatest common factor of x squared, y squared, and xy to the third is 45, then which of the following could y equal? So like, here's your which of the following. And it's could. So it's got to be one of them. And basically, it just means only one of these is going to work. And i got to look at the answers. There's no other way to do this. Because there's, there's a lot of things that the greatest common factor, or I'm sorry, there's a lot of things probably that y could equal. Uh, but they're probably not one of these choices. So here's one where I have to work with the answers. So the first thing I did when I looked at this was I said I looked at the two, the two values, Okay, x squared, y squared, and x, y to the third. And I said the GCF out of these, I could take an X out of both, and I could take an, a Y to the second out of both. Okay? So I know that that equals 45. Okay, so now I know that that's the GCF, and that equals 45. So now the next thing is I'm going to look at the answers. Okay, that's the first thing. I know that the greatest common factor is the biggest thing that can come out of those. So I factor out an X out of each, and I factor out a Y to the second out of each. So I get X, Y to the second. So you're like, well, what, what could Y equal? The only thing y ends up being able to equal is 3, okay? And you're like, well, why is that? Well, if I plug in anything bigger than 3, let's say, for instance, y was 5, right? So then I get x times 25 equals 45, and you're like, well, what's wrong with that? 
basically nothing except for the fact that x and y are positive integers, which means they have to be whole numbers. And if you look at that, if I solve for x here, if I try to find x in this case, I get a, I get a non-integer. Okay? And anything actually beyond 5, bigger than 5, you're just going to get a bigger decimal. So like, if I say like x, so I'm going to come down here. So we looked at that one. So I'm going to come down here, and if I say like x times the next one, we'll look at c, 9 squared equals 45. Now you're like 81x equals 45. That makes absolutely no sense. There's no way x could be an integer. The only one that y could be is if I look at y being 3. So then I say like x times 9 equals 45. So x equals 5 in that case. And now that's a, that's a positive integer. x and y are both positive integers. So there's one to think about. Again, working backwards from the answers, picking the ones that make the most sense. Again, the could in this problem really, really requires you to think a little bit. So um, again, work backwards from the answers. Try to think. Again, the number one thing on the challenge questions is think. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is another strategy. And the, this strategy is making an educated guess. So you don't always need to know the formula to find the answer. And here's an example. It says points M and N are the endpoints of the diameter of a circle with center at O, as shown below. It says point P is on the circle, and angle MOP is 60 degrees. The shortest distance along the circle from M to P is what percent of the distance along the circle from M to N? So you're basically like, like what's the relationship between this distance from M to P and then this whole distance from M to N? Okay? And that's the question. And you're like, okay. Immediately, I think a lot of students are going to say, like, I need, I need arc length, or I need to know how long those are. And the answer to that is, that's not true. You do not need arc length. You can just think about it. Try and educate a guess. This one's actually not too bad. Like, what would you guess? I mean, take a second, pause the video if you want. What would you guess for this one? I mean, you can sit here and listen to me, but if you want to pause it for a second, just think about it. Which one of these makes the most sense? All right, well, if you pause it and now we're back, you're looking at 60. This whole angle is a semicircle, so that's 180. What percent of 180 is 60? You're like, well, I don't know. 60 out of 180, right? So that's 0.33, repeating. So as a percent, that would be 33 and a third percent. And that's the, that's the answer to the question. It's just an educated guess. I didn't even, I don't need to know anything other than the fact that like a semicircle was 180. That's, I mean, that's, that's something that I guess you needed to know, but you don't need to know arc length. You don't need to know anything about a, you know, the, any formulas for this one. It's just straight up 60 over 180 is 33, 33 and a third. So there's a think about it question. If you found that to be easy, good. But you know, if it's tricky to you, just kind of try, try to think about a different way to do it. You don't always need to know a formula. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about it pops up from, on the ACT from time to time, and that is logs. So in general, the rule for logs that if you got log base a of x equaling y, then, then that's basically equivalent to a to the y equaling x. So that's the idea behind the log. You might see some of these questions popping up that involve the properties. Okay, So these are things that you talk about in Algebra 2. If you're taking this test before you've seen these, maybe kind of look at these, try to make sense of them. So basically the first one says log, log base a of x divided by y. You can split that up by calling it log base a of x minus log base a of y. We're going to actually use that in the problem in a second. Log base a of x times y is the same as log base a of x plus log base a of y. And then log base a of x to the n is the same as n log base a of x. You can move that power out front. So these are just some rules that, you know, either, either they are a review or they are the first time you've seen them. And we're going to look at those in this particular question. So the first one says, whenever w is an integer greater than 1, log base w of w squared, over w to the 6 equals what? This is a tricky question. If you, don't, if you know your properties of logs, though, it's not that bad, but it's still a little bit tricky. We're going to have to apply a couple things here. So when I look at this, I can split this up first of, first of all because it's a quotient. It's log base w of w squared minus log base w of w to the 6. Okay? And now you're like, well, I got some powers, so I can use my power property and move those powers out front. So that's 2 log base w of w. So I basically I used, if I'm looking at what, what I did, I used this property and then I used this property. Okay, so if you like want to rewind and look at those properties, that's what I'm doing here. So, and then minus 6 log base w of w. And now looking at that, there's a general rule that you, that you got to know. Okay, when I look at anything, 
any kind of log. So like in general, if you want to evaluate like log base two of eight, what does that equal? Okay. So like you say in your head, two to the blank equals eight. And that's the answer to the log. So if I'm looking at that, trying to determine if two to the what power makes eight. So two to what power makes eight? The answer to that is three. So log base two of eight is three. So looking at this particular problem, it's kind of like if I took log base two of two. Now I'd say two to what power equals two? And the answer to that would be one. So there's where I got to make sure I know if the base, if these two numbers are the same, that's going to equal one. So this is basically two times one minus six times one. So in general, a general rule for logs is like log base A of A equals one. So anytime those are the same, you're gonna get just one. So looking at this particular problem again, finishing this off, okay, you can you could scroll down or align if you wanna see these things, but two minus six ends up equaling negative four. And if I look at my choices, that's choice F. All right, so not an easy question, but it definitely, um, uses a lot of the properties of logs that you learn in Algebra 2. And if you hadn't seen those yet, try to learn from this video. I'm not expecting this to teach you, but um, again, challenging questions. The biggest thing to remember is that when you do a challenge question, open your brain. Think about it, right? What is the question asking you to do? And if you can determine what it's asking you to do, a lot of times you have the skills. So just be confident.